Hello. Welcome to Principles of Finance. I am your lecturer, Natalia Francois. And in this session, we are going to look at the role of managerial finance. Now, our learning objectives are to define finance and its two categories, identify and differentiate the three major forms of business, identify and explain the goals of the firm, explain how finance is related to accounting and economics, and identify the activities of the financial manager, and describe the agency problems and corporate governance. Now, what is finance? Finance is the art and science of managing money. Now, on a personal level, it involves, you know, how much you earn. So if you're working, it will be a salary. If you're a business, it will be your income or your revenue. How much you earn, out of your earnings, how much do you spend? Out of those same earnings, how much do you save? Out of the same earnings, how much do you invest? So it involves that process. In a business context, finance involves the same types of decisions. Raising money, as I said, your revenue, your income. When that money is raised, how is it spent? Right? Does it spend on company expenses? How much is invested? Um, this is assets. And uh, how much is distributed? Finance is learning the techniques of good financial analysis will not only help you better, you know, make financial decisions as a consumer, but it will also help you understand the financial consequences of important business decisions you will face no matter what career path you choose to follow. So this subject, what is finance? Finance is the art and science of managing money. This subject would help you in your personal financial decision making and management, as well as your career in whatever part you choose, finance will assist you. Now, finance has two fields. So when you hear persons studying in finance, they're either studying in the financial services or the managerial services. Financial services is the design and delivery of advice and financial products. Offers career opportunities in personal financial planning, investments, banking, real estate, and insurance. So those financial services that pertain to um, ad products and advice. So your finance, your agent, your insurance agent, right? Your banking relationships, your investment banks. They will all fall under financial services. Now, when you study finance, we also study finance at the managerial level. So managerial finance focuses on duties of the financial manager. So this is the person who works in an organization that manages the financial part. So the financial tasks would include planning, um, extending credit to customers, evaluating proposed large expenditures, raising money to fund the firm's operations, managing cash flow, and protect against financial risks. So if you study finance, um, these are the two areas you can focus on or work, build a career in. Now, we have legal forms of a business. You have three legal forms. Legal means registration of your business as a sole proprietor, a partnership or a corporation now if you go back to your introduction to business you would remember you know these forms of business but legal forms of business so it's not just having a business but registering a business and becoming very compliant either as a sole trader a partnership or a corporation let's look at them so a sole proprietor a sole trader owned and operates by one person. It's one person owns and operates, make all the decisions for the business. How is it financed? It's financed through personal funds or borrowed funds from this one person, right? All the profits belong to the owner. 
this form of business has unlimited liability. Unlimited liability will mean that all the responsibility, all the debts, everything would fall on the business or the person because they are sole proprietorship. So all the risk, all the income, everything, all the liability falls directly on the sole proprietor. Now let's talk partnership. Partnership, two or more persons doing a business together for a profit, right? So two persons, a few persons come together, same goal in mind to operate a business for profit. We classify them or we register them as a partnership. All partners have unlimited liability, same as a total trader. They're totally responsible for all the risk. Funds are raised through partners, pool funds and borrowings. Now, if you compare to the sole trader, um, it's just that one person has to come up with all the money, while as a partnership, you have the funds being raised through pool funds. The number of partners bring in the money or they borrow money together and bring it into the business. Profits are shared among partners and this is determined um, before setting up or before registering how will profits be shared would it be proportionate meaning how much you bring in a proportion or would it be shared equally then we have corporations corporations the owners are the shareholders or stockholders so as opposed to a partnership being a part of a corporation the owner being an owner of a corporation what you do you buy shares or stocks they use the word interchangeably so stockholders have limited liability right so all the risk would only fall on the percentage or the amount that they put in they only stand to lose that amount and not their personal liability right stockholders receive dividends or share appreciation as earnings so they don't receive um, the profit as we have with the sole trader and the partnership for a corporation they receive dividends so when profit is made at the end of the year the board of directors will decide how dividends dividends is returned for the stock that you hold so would it be ten dollars per share so if i have 10 shares i bought into this company and they're paying a dollar per share i have 10 shares i'll get ten dollars right to the side on this diagram we have um we have what we called uh organizational chart so we can see how our corporation is set up we have the stockholders we have um all the stockholders they who elect the board of directors and board of directors then hires a president or ceo to manage the company and from there it flows down so the president can do all the work by himself he's responsible or he reports to the board of directors so he has underneath him you know vice presidents who are in charge of different units within an organization in this unit we have hr units so you have a vice president of hr vice president of manufacturing vice president of finance or who you would call your chief financial officer vice president of marketing vice president of information technology so this type of organization chart could basically be for a manufacturing organization now we're into finance. So let's look at the, the hierarchy under the CFO. So the CFO reports to the president who reports to the board of directors. But the CFO, you know, can't do all of the financial work. Remember, we talk about um, managerial finance, right? It's looking at creditors, you know, complying with taxes, making investment decisions, you know, dealing with the financial part of the organization. So the, the CFO arm is divided into two areas. We have the treasurer and the controller. Controller, sometimes they say controller. Um, you may hear it for the first time, but it basically the controller is what we call the accounting manager or the accounts manager, right? They are basically in charge of the accounting part. So we differentiate accounting from finance. So the accounting part is under the controller 
who will deal with you know making me tax compliant as you see there's a tax manager cost accounting manager corporate accounting manager financial accounting manager so that controller deals directly with the accounting task the treasurer now deals directly with the finance task of capital expenditure credit foreign exchange pension cash financial planning and fundraising All right now this is this is a very unique um um this is a very unique ooh, organizational chart right so maybe you'll have one person performing maybe all those six tasks in reality but this is how you know they make sure they cater for all the areas of finance and all the areas of accounting so we know the legal forms of a business now the finance rule as we just described the cfo oversees all financial aspects of the business that's the man who reports directly to the president oversees all he makes financial decisions based on the information from the treasurer and the controller now you see the treasurer now he gives he's responsible for handling the finance activities financial planning fundraising capital expenditure cash management credit management pension fund foreign exchange activities so he reports this to the cfo the controller now, on the other hand, he's responsible for the accounting activities, corporate accounting, management, financial accounting, and cost accounting. Now the goal, we ask, what is the goal of the firm? What's the main goal of any firm? We're still dealing with managerial finance. All right, so we have that identified, we have identified what is finance, you know, we have identified the legal forms of business. We have identified um, the role of the finance managers. And now we're looking at the goal. What's the goal of any firm or corporation firm? It's to maximize the shareholders' wealth. Now we have two. One is to maximize the shareholders' wealth. Remember we said shareholders or stockholders are the individuals or companies that buy shares so they buy ownership into a company buying ownership in a company you want to get some type of return so the main goal should be for the firm is to give you back a return for the money invested so financial managers should accept only actions in doing their work that are expected to increase the share price so if you buy a share of ownership into the company for a hundred dollars per share what you want to do is make sure that this share value you know it goes up in price in capitalization value so it should be maybe next year two years three years ten years from now it shouldn't be the same hundred dollars it should be going up and up and up in value that's giving your shareholders maximizing your shareholders wealth right so the diagram explains the financial manager decision how much foreign exchange should we hold? Should we give creditors? Um, should we give extend more credits? Should we um, buy new equipment? These decisions that they have to make, you know, they examine the returns that will come in as well as the risk. If it increases the share price, they accept. If it would not increase the share price, they reject. So we can see from here that some type of forecasting has to be done. The next goal of the firm is to maximize profit. So the first thing was to maximize the shareholders wealth, which is that stock price. You want that stock price to improve or increase year after year. Now profits. Now profit is profit profit is a profit comes after all the expenses has been deducted from the revenue. This profit is what is shared as dividends. So we said being part of a corporation or owning a corporation, you buy a share, right? And how do you benefit from that share? Either your share price goes up in value, market capitalization value, and or you receive dividends from the profit that the company makes. Right, so what we call earnings per share is that amount that you get per share that you hold when profit is made. So let's look at this. Nick Dukakis, a financial manager of Neptune Manufacturing. 
a producer of marine engine components, is choosing between two investments. There's Roto and there's Valve. The following table shows the earning per share that each investment is expected to have over its three-year life. Now look at it. Roto, Roto investment is in year one, the earnings per share is $1.40. You're going to get from purchasing this. A dollar in year two, 40 cents in year three. Total value in three years, 280. Valve, on the other hand, um, 60 cents, a dollar, 140, $3. Right, even though you see first year for Valve is smaller and it gets larger the third year and it's end up to the highest. Now, a financial manager who has to maximize profit as his goal, that's the goal of the firm set out for him, will choose the Valve, right? Um, he'll choose the valve over the rotor because it returns a higher earning per share. Now, how does profit maximization lead to increase in share price? Profit maximization leads to increased share price. So we just said the goal is to maximize the profits to make sure that, you know, the, the decisions we make is going to return a higher profits on the per share. And as well, if we maximize shareholders, well, the share price will be increased. So how, how does this work? How does the profit maximization lead to increased share price? There are three factors, time. The sooner the return, the better. Right. So if we go back to the example of router and valve, if, if it is two years to give a better return, we're going to take that. So time is a factor. The sooner the return, the better. We spend $500,000 today, if we get a return for it, in two years and we spent five hundred thousand dollars on something else and the return is five years we're going to take the one for two years the sooner the better the other factor is return now the returns will be the income money made or lost on an investment over a period of time it's the cash flow only when profits and cash flow increases does it affect the, the, the share price so we must make profits and our cash flow must be coming in we don't just buy a car and no money coming in from the car or van. Once money is coming in, it's, still, it's increasing the share price. We take into consideration risk. Risk is an important factor in finance. Risk, most investors are risk adverse, which causes the share price to be affected by the trade-off between return and risk. So if risk is stable and return increases, the share price would increase. Profit does not account for its own risk. Risk the possibility that actual outcome may differ from expected outcome. That's just the definition of risk. The possibility that the actual outcome may, may differ from the expected outcome. So what risk are we taking? We know we're supposed to get a return of 1 million, right? That's the expected, but what's the real possibility of the actual? Would it be 500, 600? Should we take the risk? These are the decisions that are used by the financial manager. So in terms of how the profit occurs, we have to take into consideration time, return, and risk so that we can maximize this profit as well as increase our share price. Now we talk about ethics and the share price. Standard code of ethics and moral judgments are set. Right. Ethical behavior is therefore viewed as necessary for achieving the firm's goal of owner's wealth maximization. So, you know, you have challenges where if you go back to the organizational chart, the owners are the shareholders, but who's managing the company? The CEO and you know, the president and um, the managers, if they don't act ethically and with moral judgment you know this would affect the share price if you can think about an organization i want to call any names but you know the management didn't act um legally not legally sorry ethically you know in their judgments what you find the share price will fall because people are no longer interested in investing in this company the benefits of having good ethics it reduces potential litigation and judgment cost. You know, it maintains a positive corporate image. Keep your share price up.
It builds shareholders' confidence and gains loyalty. Commitments and respect of the firm's stakeholders. Such actions by maintaining and enhancing cash flow and reducing perceived risk can positively affect the firm's share price. Now, how is finance related to economics? We have economics and economists, sorry, pays attention to the market. We know that. He looks at economic trends, inflation, employment level, taxes, interest rates, exchange rates, business cycles, and so forth. The financial manager, he needs this information to help make the best possible decision. Now, economic theories, law of demand and supply, manager of course, benefit analysis. We use those things in finance. So let's do an example. The example says a new computer would require a cash outlay of $8,000. So we're looking to buy a computer for $8,000. The old computer could be sold for $2,000. The total benefit from the new computer would be $10,000. Total benefit we'll get from it. Well, it's cash flow. Um, added to returns, it's $10,000. The benefit over a similar time period for the old computer would be $3,000. So if you buy the new computer for ten for $8,000 and sell the old one for $2,000, we'll get $10,000 benefit. But if we keep the old computer, we'll only get $3,000. Now, should we keep this old computer? Or should we upgrade this is where we use the cost benefit analysis so here we have a table on the left benefits with new computer is ten thousand less benefits with old computer right seven thousand so the marginal benefit is seven thousand let's look at the cost so the cost of the new computer is eight thousand if we sell the old one we get two thousand for it so the marginal cost is six thousand What's the net benefit? The net benefit is the marginal benefit minus the marginal cost. The net benefit is $1,000. Yeah, it's a benefit. The benefit is not negative. So we should buy the new computer. What about accounting? Yeah, finance and accounting use interchangeably. How is it related? To both the finance and accounting activities, they overlap each other. A financial manager needs to be able to interpret these financial statements and understand accounting. So the financial manager is not really preparing those account statements, right? But they are given to him, it's passed on, and he has to be able to interpret this information so that he can make his decisions. However, there are two different differences, major differences. Cash flow. Accountants use accrual method versus financial managers interested in cash method. And we know from accounting one, fundamentals of accounting, we know that the accrual method is we record revenue um, when it is incurred and expenses when it is good, not when it is received. Cash method, that's the cash method. So the financial manager is really concerned with the cash method because he wants to make sure that there, there's life in the businesses, which is cash running through the business. Decision making is another major difference. Accountants focuses on their financial data. Who says financial managers uses the financial data and combine it with market data to make decisions. So let's look at this activity here, cash flow. NASA Corporation, a small yacht dealer, sold one yacht. All right, so it's a corporation, they're selling, they sold a yacht for 100,000 in the year calendar year just ended the yacht was purchased during the year at a total of eighty thousand all of the firm paid in full for the yacht during the year at the end of the year it has it has yet to collect the hundred thousand from the customer so what are we seeing here they bought the yacht for eighty thousand they sold it for a hundred thousand however the customer has not paid in full as yet so in the accounting books, it will be recorded as purchase, 80,000, right? Um, sales, 100,000. So as far as the accountant is concerned, we've made a profit of 20,000. The financial manager now, he looks at the cash flow that comes in. So how much cash flow came in from this yacht? None. 
because the customer hasn't paid us yet. Maybe we have an arrangement for them to pay in 90 days. But what about cash outflow? We paid 80,000 for it. So what is the net cash? The financial manager is looking at is 80,000. It's negative because we didn't get the cash flow for it. So that's just how they see things differently. Now, just a personal finance application because we're dealing with finance. Let's put it together in our personal life. This is Anne, Anne's, Anne's budget. You do a budget when you um, get paid. So she has net pay received. This is after all her taxes and so forth. She will take, take home 4400 Her expenses include rent, 1200 That's a good rent. Car payment, 450 all right, well, let's see this US. Utilities 300, grocery 800, clothes 750, dining out 650, gasoline is 260. Interest income, right? 220. So maybe she has a investment somewhere that she is receiving interest. This is good. Miscellaneous expenses 425. But when we look at her inflow, 4620 our outflow is 4835 we can see here that Anne needs 215 dollars to cover her, her monthly expenses she's short so she has what can she do yeah she reduced some expenses if she can dining out because that was a lot of money clothes she could reduce clothes for that month or maybe groceries because she's dining out on groceries you know we don't know but we could suggest even miscellaneous something can be done yeah or she finds another source of income to cover her 215 if she wants to maintain her lifestyle now we have here the primary activities of the financial manager so we're talking all about finance and you know all these things about decision making cash inflow outflow what's the main activities in addition to ongoing involvement in financial analysis and planning, the financial manager's primary activities are making investment and financing decisions. And this is what we're going to learn a lot about in this class. Investment decisions determine what types of assets, what type of assets the firm holds. So when we say assets, it don't just mean building, equipment, trucks, right? We're talking about financial assets. Financial assets would include stocks some other companies bonds um derivatives and other financial assets that the firm can invest in right so that they can get money to run the business they also look at financing decisions determine how the firm raises money to pay for its assets in which it invests so they want to get a new warehouse. This financial manager's primary activity is to make this financial decision of how the firm is going to raise the money to pay for this warehouse. They don't just wake up in the morning and say we're buying a warehouse. Right? They have to look at what's happening with the organization and make their interpretation, their analysis, whether we should maybe go and offer more stocks, maybe we should go to the bank, maybe we should sell some type of financial asset for security to raise the money for these future investments now one way to visualize the difference between the firm's investment and financing decision is to refer to your balance sheet shown in your figure 1.3 so you go to your text and look at that balance sheet for the area and you'll see you would see um financing decisions come under the capital area and um, sorry, investment decisions come on the capital and the finance decisions come on top of like your assets. Now, investment decisions generally refer to items that appear on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. <laughs> and financial decisions relate to those that appear on the right side. So, um, so look at it again. Look at figure 1.3. Sorry, I didn't put the figure in here. Um, where the investment decision, as they say, appear on the left-hand side. Right, so they will make investments in asset classes while the financing is you know how they raise the money are they raising it to shares or loans right 
Corporate governance. Corporate governance refers to the rules, processes, and laws by which companies are operated, controlled, and regulated. Isn't that so wonderful? Because imagine a society without rules, regulations. It defines the rights and responsibilities of the corporate participants, participants such as the shareholders, what's their rights and responsibilities. You know, we like to talk a lot about rights, but we do have responsibilities as well. What's that, what are they for the board of directors? officers and managers and other stakeholders as well as rules and procedures for making corporate decisions would you like to go to a firm and these things are set out for you as a finance manager or even a board of director a well-defined corporate governance structure is intended to benefit all corporate stakeholders by ensuring that the firm is run in a lawful and ethical fashion lawful and ethical fashion because remember we want to maximize those shareholders um profit and we talk about ethics being correct and you know decisions make happening not personally or non ethically so the share price could stay up or grow in accordance with best practices and subject to all corporate regulations now before before corporate governance or if a company doesn't have these rules and these regulations in place what we have is agency problems we call them agency because the agents who are the managers um, who have been given the task to maximize the shareholders wealth which is the share price and to maximize profits sometimes they act in their own behalf so I may become a manager and yes, this is the goal of the firm, but the goal of the firm is not my goal. My goal is to make sure that I grow this company by customers Right, a marketing manager, grow the company by customers and I am functioning under my own provisions that this and this and this and that's what I have to do to grow. And forgetting the goals of the firm and it could cause a little conflict right or maybe my goal is to um, get a good name for myself so I'm not going to make some types of decisions that may be risky but the firm could accept it but I'm thinking about my name so I'm not making a decision based on the firm I'm making a personal decision we call those agency problems now let's look at some of these agency problems in this video in this video we're going to look at agency problems suppose an entrepreneur gets an idea and she hires people to work on her idea and she buys inventory all investing her own money her idea is a big success and soon sales are coming in. She keeps the profits she earns and she's highly motivated to work on making her company more effective and efficient. Five years later, business is booming and she has an initial public offering. She raises $10 million and decides it's time to move on to new projects. Now the company is owned by thousands of stockholders who hope the company's profits will continue to rise. A new professional manager is brought in to run the firm who reports to the board of directors. Now there is a separation between who owns the firm and the agent who controls the firm. Agency problems are problems that arise due to this separation between ownership and control. Though they both want the firm to be successful, their interests may not always be perfectly aligned. For example, shareholders want high total shareholder returns, which means stock growth and dividends. They also want a good risk-return ratio, which means they may be willing to take a high risk in return for high profitability. Managers might want high pay and benefits, good reputation job security, or other things like power and status, or maybe the ability to change the world. 
When owners' and agents' interests aren't aligned, it can lead to unanticipated and undesirable consequences. If managers want high salaries, it can lead to fat compensation plans. If managers want status and power, it can lead to pursuit of growth instead of profitability. If managers want lower personal risk, it can lead to over-diversified companies. And if managers want corporate jets and long vacations, it can lead to wasteful spending. So how do we align the interests of stockholders and managers? We can make managers hold lots of company stock, but that can make managers under-diversified and even more risk-averse. We can give the board of directors control over the CEO's pay and termination, but most boards do not meet frequently, and members may be less familiar with the firm's operations than managers, and they may feel beholden to the CEO. Corporate governance is a complex puzzle that uses interrelated strategies to try to reduce the likelihood and severity of agency problems. All right, so we see we see the differences in 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 person's objectives. So they may not want to mark they not not just may not want to, they accept the job, but their personal interest takes over the goals of the firm, which is to maximize profit and uh, to maximize the shareholders' wealth. Now in summary, let's look at we started off saying we have six objectives. So our study today showed us that finance is, we've defined finance as the science and art of managing money. We talk about legal forms of business. Organizations are the sole proprietorship, the partnership, and the corporation. Now the goal of the firm is to maximize its shareholders' value, and therefore the wealth of its shareholders. Maximize the value of the firm means running the business in the interest of those who own it, the shareholders. The financial manager must understand the economic environment and rely heavily on the economic principles of managerial cost benefit analysis to make financial decisions. And financial managers use accounting by concentrating on cash flows and decision making. Now, the primary activities of the financial manager, in addition to ongoing involvement in financial analysis and planning, are making investment decisions and making financing decisions. A firm corporate governance structure is intended to help ensure that managers act in the best interest of the firm, shareholders, and other stakeholders. Now, that's your lecture for today. I'll see you in the next session. Now, go. Now you're going to go into eLearn and complete the activity under this unit, right? And this unit was entitled Introduction to Managerial Finance. Good luck.